So, we were talking about uh, six and one in the context of efforts towards harmony. And um, though I was saying the basic premise, that the purpose of the six and one is to release will from the propensities of obligation. That's what it does. That um, we're naturally wanting to form loving relationships. And then at that point, the loving is a conscious act. There's like in love and being love. Got to go through the in love stage. But it doesn't last for the whole length, the whole duration, unless we cultivate it. There's a natural, at the beginning point, this in love stage. It's easy to love the other. Then we want to be able to have our intention to love the other continue, carry us through as we negotiate the six and one. So the, um, we, we were talking also about how um, our family of origin had certain dynamics, had certain karmic um, characteristics that we bring with us to our, our love relationships, the subsequent relationships. And that, that's a good thing. That lets us genuinely have those, those um, snags, those places where the, the formation of who we are as individuals, we can recapitulate those, we can heal those. And I mean, the, the ultimate, like the bottom line is the, the numbers that my folks did to me, I'm not going to do to my kids. That was like, you know, the obvious thing, how the, how the generations improve themselves. You know, there's this thing like, oh, we want the kids to be materially and, and have all the advantages that we didn't have. That's like what the immigrant has, what they bring, you know, they, they want to have that. Um, that's the natural quality of the parents. We want our kids to exceed us. Yeah. We want them also on the emotional level to have less obstacles to experiencing and expressing who they really are in relationship. How can we do that? By us working through our stuff in the family of origin. And it's not just family of origin, you know, that makes us who we are, obviously. The six in one addresses that. So this thing is like, oh, we're going to have our will. We want to be able to apply our full, clear, clean will in the loving of the other, that is, wanting their happiness and doing what we can to help them manifest their total happiness in this lifetime. That's, that's the working definition of what we mean with love, you know. It's really complex because love is also the attachment and the bonds and so forth like that. Well, we were also talking about how there's a difference between relationship and partnership. And the relationship is vows. And that what um, the six and one is a part of is the efforts towards harmony, which is a larger context of vows. But the six and one works before the vows. So we start working our stuff through, knowing that it's going to show up when we're, when we're getting more and more intimate with potential partner. 
then when you're in, when you're going from relationship to partnership, it's fantastic to do it together, to practice six and one together. What is the practice of six and one? It's very simple. You set aside 20 to 40 minutes a day and you reflect on the following. There's one for each day. You do six days in a row. And then on the seventh, you rest. <clears throat> and the first one, the first contemplation of the six and one is the my mother slash myself contemplation. The second is the my father slash myself contemplation. The third is the my family slash myself contemplation. The fourth is the my peer group slash myself contemplation. In puberty, sometimes it's my peer parent slash myself contemplation. Then the fifth is the my culture slash myself contemplation. The sixth is the my society slash myself contemplation. What actually goes on in the contemplations during those 20 to 40 minutes? Fritz was intentionally loose and open. So um, based on your style and what you, how you want to work, you work in that way. If we're just holding the container for, oh, if it's, if it's a quiet sit, a meditation, you know, for that time, and you're just bringing up that relationship and feeling into it, what's there, what emotions come up, what memories come up, you just let it wash, just let it you know, work through is one way. Journaling is another way. Drawing is another way. Sculpture, dance, whatever, gets you into what you need to experience and express to heal that most crucial relationship. Um, as I was saying, this was communicated to me by my buddy Fritz, spiritual mentor, and spiritual friend is how he presented himself. But to me, he was genuinely a teacher, you know, and taught by example. He had been in uh, orphanages and gangs as his formative years and had somehow manifested as this beautiful, loving husband and father and, you know, had, had done this and, and a great spiritual adept as well but had done this kind of inner work, you know, back when it was needed and now was able to manifest this, this beautiful, loving, generous kind of spirit that just enriched, you know, personally very much enriched my life. But he was also kind of a wrathful, kind of an interesting character and he had a lot of shamanic, uh, undertones and practices and so he he manifested a lot of different ways to different people like Oz you know in the Wizard of Oz the actual wizard would appear you know with what people were bringing and that was very much the case I could go on and on that's a whole other topic is is who was Fritz and how was he and I definitely want to do some videos and some some more exploration of that but his great legacy, you know, what he gave as his last will and testament was the six and one. When the first time I met him, he was already checking out. He had advanced stages of MS disease. But, again, like a, a, a real testament to his practice and his inner development, the further he progressed into greater and greater states of decrepitude, as he would say, the more compassion, the more generous, the more present you know, he was with me and everyone who came to 
to see him. So that was like another thing, how, how, how um, at peace he was with that. But it was urgent, you know, he needed something to give that would, that would be a benefit for years to come. So six and one was part of that. And I had it in my possession, and I didn't, I didn't really take it seriously or enter into it for years. It's not, you know, a must-do thing. But there was one um, kind of uh, addition that our other wonderful spiritual friend Michael added to it, which was how to really engage it in a disciplined way. He said to so you do three week courses. You do one a day for six days and rest, and then start again, rest and start again. So you have a three week continuity of the practice. And his, his uh, stickler was, if you miss a day for any reason, it doesn't count. You have to start the three weeks over again. So there's this incentive to have a, a continuity and, and keep, the, keep the discipline of it. But um, that was something later added from one of Fritz's main students. Um, then like, what is it? Oh, it's, what is the my mother, myself, my father, myself, my family, myself. What is that? It's how we define ourselves based on that most crucial relationship. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, mother was your whole world, was everything. Indeed, we're born in this state of great dependence. Entirely we are dependent upon mother or the mother, the, the one who's fulfilling that mother role for our very material existence, right? She saves our life repeatedly. So we're in this state of physical dependence, emotional dependence. And bit by bit, through these relationships, we're raised to a state of apparent independence. We say apparent because this is coming also a little bit mostly from the Buddhist worldview. There's total interconnectedness. The great illusion is that, oh, we're so independent and self-made, you know, individuals. When in actuality, the, the height of independence, we're totally dependent still on, on the interdependence, on the karma, on the, the, you know, John Muir was like, oh, if you tug on any, you've got to try to single out one little thing in the universe and tug on it to separate it out, you find it's connected to everything else. I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing. But um, this illusion of independence is something very valuable in our time. You know, how we're raised in the postmodern culture. We want to have a strong, healthy sense of ego, identity, self-love, self-worth, self-respect, all these things, acceptance. That's essential in having healthy relationships. And then, ultimately, we're going to lay that down, like see through it. Having a healthy ego is the, one of the upshots of 6 and one practice. You end up with a healthy ego a healthy sense of self, and the recognition that there's much, much more beyond that. And uh, sometimes it would be how how Fritz was talking about you wouldn't you wouldn't communicate this to or tantric teachings that that are about ego transcendence. We don't communicate to folks who are like under age. There's a certain age and stage and a certain ripeness that has to occur 
for the like a scope of awareness to increase, that makes it more natural to, to um, uh, engage in practices that go beyond the me, myself, and I complex. And indeed, you're saying it's very natural, like how a snake sheds its skin. We don't go along like, oh, snake, you've got to grow, and we rip off the skin. We provide a, a rock, a good place, you know, s- and then the snake, when it's feeling safe and ready to grow, sheds its skin. But we're going a little bit beyond. That's like, like the the further spiritual context in which six and one practice makes sense. So really, the ultimate relationship, what he's saying here, how six and one is effective, is you on you. That's the first relationship. We want to have it clean and clear, loving, respectful all that in place, then we extend that to others and naturally we're going to attract loving relationships. I don't know if we mentioned, but we were talking about vows and how the the borderline, the delineation between relationship and partnership is vows. And um, before vows, you can do six and one with yourself. And if someone else you're in relationship with is open to it, you can communicate it. It's no problem. But he was really emphasizing how after vows are taken, then you do six and one together. And this was a really, a really amazing thing for my wife and I when we were getting together after we got married sharing the six in one like in a a very disciplined way like we do a three week cycle and like taking that same 20 to 40 minutes together like timing our days so we have that time together and um, and we would do it in different ways like sharing it live or go and do a depth thing and then share what you discovered and I learned so much about who this person was, you know, that I was with, from this inside space, and was able to, you know, share as much as I knew at that point. And it's like an onion skin, obviously, an onion type thing. You go deeper with it as the years progress, and you see it from a different light. And then sometimes when we have it in place, well, oh, there's a particular problem coming up. We'd say, okay, let's do a six in one around that issue, like we have a, a, a way of working with our minds, with our relationship, it just starts to really create that space as something you know, that takes a priority. And um, Fritz would also talk about this kind of funny thing, it's a bit of a, a loose characterization about the four stages of relationship, how there's the in love stage the power struggle stage, the projection stage, and then the stage of genuine intimacy. I'm like, oh yeah, I want to skip right to the end. But it doesn't happen without the other stages. And um, it seems seems like a projection oversimplification, but it, it helps, you know. Like when we get to this point in the relationship where it's like, who's gonna lead? who's going to have the most energy and initiation and initiative in the relationship, it's a struggle. It's like, who is it going to be? Me or you? What is it? And it changes, you know? And um, then the real, and six and one is great to get going there. Like who in your family of origin, if there was a mother and father, who took the lead? Then, um, in the projection phase, it's like suddenly she is sounding just like my mom, 
to me and I'm sounding just like her dad to her. We've, we've gone so deep, like the, the material is there and the projection. Having the nonviolent communication skills helps so much with the power struggle phase. Clearing the emotions so we can talk and work things through. Like having the self-empathy to be able to feel and acknowledge what's the emotion that's going on now. How can I skillfully communicate that to my beloved? And um, in a way that doesn't trigger them, in a way that they can hear. All of that comes through the NVC training, mm. nonviolent communication skills. Is is I think should be a standard manual mm. for getting married. Um, then the other one was "Hold Me Tight" from um, Dr. Sue Johnson, psychologist who worked out this stuff with uh, bonding and how babies need bonding. Turns out grown-ups need bonding, too. In relationship, that's a big thing. We get in, in states of uh, a bond. And in that, we recapitulate the snags that we have in bonding. So that's the, the antidote for the, um, power, the, the projection phase. Power struggle phase, NVC, Projection phase, EFT, which is emotionally focused therapy. There's the tapping EFT, and then there's the other EFT. Sue Johnson's work, Hold Me Tight. That's the book for that. So that's kind of the whole nugget of the six and one. And um, I'm sure there's there's questions or. How's that yeah. landing on you? Yeah, uh, sounds good. Sounds really awesome. Um, the NVC I've, I've been recently getting into. I've been reading some Marshall Rosenberg's books, and I caught up with the group in town and got to go to a meeting there. They've got a little group going on to yeah. teach and practice. So that's wonderful. Yeah, I'm really excited to discover that. Um, and um, couldn't get my partner to join me in studying that at all or looking into it. Um, when we were still in some sort of a partnership. Um, so I was just doing it on my own. And um, yeah, the I think, is the EFT, is that the same as the also maybe emotional freedom technique? Nope, is it, that's it's a different one, okay. That's the tapping. Okay. Emotionally focused therapy is the EFT from Sue Johnson. Okay. And um, it's in a book called Hold Me Tight is where she really makes it like accessible. But it's all about the bonding that affects us when we're entering into a state of bondedness with our beloved. And it is fascinating, brilliant work that really has has, you know, deepened our six in one process. And again, you know, it's like, oh, the sixth one was this, it's a larger context for any sort of process work that you want to do. Like you got that 20 to 40 minutes every day. <laughs> and other techniques and other modalities as they're being discovered and developed, you know, can fit into that. It's just about healing the snags in these developmental stages so that who you really are shows up more in the relationship. Nice. And in relationship with myself. Absolutely. That's it. get so excited when you're laying here.
want to tell everybody about it. <laughs> Don't really. We're going to take it from you. <laughs> the focused attention, focused awareness of self and mother, you know, makes the first six and one. And it's how is it that I'm defined, you know, like what have I just unconsciously acquired from mom? Mom always hated black people. So I completely hate black people. Oh hold on, I I just, you know, took that on. Maybe I can examine that. How much of that is mother? How much of that is me? And then hopefully we can outgrow that prejudice. Um, likewise, oh, mother hated black people and I hate her prejudiced behavior, you know. So I'm joining the Black Panthers, <laughs> or I'm a, I'm a Black Panther supporter. Oh, you know, maybe I want to re-examine, oh, some forgiveness for wha- how she was raised and how she didn't question. So that's, that's one of the pieces, you know, that I've discovered. And it's, there's so much more to discover, but it's like how we define ourselves in collusion in those relationships, and in yeah, opposition, like against those relationships. Sometimes it's the against bit that's even more hard to tease out of how we define ourselves regarding those relationships. And that's not wrong, it's not, it's, it's, the thing is, how is it unconscious? How does it steal away our willpower when we're going to love the other. That's the main thing we're negotiating to voidness. Those obstacles to loving the other, through the six and one, we can negotiate to voidness. <laughs> that was one of the ways. Nice. Yep. Just put in. And similarly with the, my father, myself my family, myself. And family, he meant like blood relations. It was the way he first communicated it. And the peer group is very important. Peer parent in adolescence, if you haven't been fully parented, if you're not being fully parented by your parents, then the peer group is your parent. Mm. Okay. They're going to finish the parenting you know, when it's, if it's really bad. But, you know, I can't stand mom and dad to go out, or the whole family. There's no one in the blood relations that's doing the family thing. So the peer group t- picks up the slack. But also in, in the fully healed, six in one, the peer group is where the beloved emerges. Your beloved is one of your peers. Special peer. Then there's this question of, oh, what's culture, what's society? You can Google it. Look at the definitions are great, you know what a culture is, what a society is, and how we define ourselves in the context of that. It's very interesting. And um, developmentally, it's something that happens as we're older. You know, all of these are stages. So now at my advanced age, I feel myself, you know, I get much more influence of definition from my society, who I consider, how people see me 
is in the context of my role in society as a father, as a husband, as a business owner, a healer, etc. But obviously we're all more, we're so, all of us are so much more than any of these relations, relationships, the definitions. That's one of the things. With the beloved, you can go way past all definitions. And if you're comfortable with that, then there's this wide open, brilliant realm of experience, you know, authenticity that can happen there. Um, this is part of my interpretation. This is still, you know, some of my st stuff I've discovered. Why six and one is still important to me, you know? That um, who we are is so much more than our relationships. But the relationships is all important, you know, while we're in the relative condition. It's all about relationships and, and the enlightenment or the awakening or the evolution, the personal spiritual evolution. It always happens in the context of relations, of the relationships. It doesn't happen anywhere else. So it's not like, oh, we're going to go into the 6 and one and then my relationship with my alcoholic father or whatever, <laughs> being, you know, example here, is suddenly going to get marvelous. No, you know, I still have my buttons pushed. But it doesn't, it doesn't push me so much more off kilter than it used to. You know, I can see it in a larger context. I have forgiveness for myself, for my relation, and for the whole process. It's a little bit more humorous, more space in it, and then, uh, yeah, more of showing up with who is really here, what's really going on which was ultimately what Fritz was all about. He was saying like, there's only one thing going on and all you have to do is dig it. One of his, that's a Fritz-ism. <laughs> but um, mostly he's about the non-attachment, the total not grasping. This is message again and again and again. And you'll see that in the, the efforts towards harmony. To love without grasping is like the highest. How we love and the, the way we want to love another. My buddy used to work this through with the ownership fields. The ownership fields. And it's very interesting, in Hindi, the language, they don't have the verb to have. Hmm. They ha it's a di there's ways of communicating it, expressing it, but it's like, I'm with my daughter, and she is. It's like the, the grammatical translation. If you want to say, yes, I have a daughter. But this idea of an ownership field, you know, like, I, who I was, I was beloved, you know, of my father because I was this and this and this kind of way. You know, the, the idea of conditional love comes in. Can, I, can we love the other unconditionally? No matter who they are, no matter what they're doing, we just give the love. That's the measure, you know of having worked the six and one through. And that's really what it's all about, just the maximum loving of yourself and others 
any any moment, any particular situation. That's the quick quick route. Yeah, ownership field was something that um, uh, my buddy James would work with, would integrate with his um, six in one process. And we should probably consult with him to get, you know, what, what he was really working with in that. That'd be an interesting question. But the, um, we were kind of, we were trying to hint at it. It was like how, you know, I was my father's boy. And my dad also owned a sports car. <laughs> but, you know, his relationship with me, hopefully, is a lot different than his relationship with his sports car. But there were certain criteria, there were certain, like, ways in which I would express myself, you know, to fit what he ex wanted of me, what he expected of his son. That's healthy, that's normal, until it's not. Until dad, you know, insists that I become an engineer instead of an artist. I want to be a poet. I have a fantastic aptitude for poetry, you know, but to, to fit into the relationship with my dad, he's going to make sure that I choose the engineering path, as an example. And if I want to be loved within that ownership field, I have to conform. Until it's just too constricting, and I have to grow past it. So in subtle ways, you know, how we, um, w when we're with the beloved, there's a way of saying like, oh yes, she is mine. Mine, you know, is part ownership field. And I am hers, you know, I belong to her. So it's that sense of belonging, really getting into that, that heldness, the bond of the belonging, without all of the expectations and the, and the contortions to fit someone else's expectations, that an ownership field entitles one, or, or you know, expects of one, ownership field. Um, conditions one, and that's what we're meaning by you know oh, I was I was loved conditionally. You know, that's okay. I was willing to live up to those conditions. That was part of my my growing up. Now, if I want to love someone unconditionally, I haven't had that modeled. You know, my folks did, you know, there was glimpses. Every mother with baby that touches, you know, oh my gosh, there's this thing of unconditional love. It's there, it's possible. But the mama bear instinct is like, yes, I love this one, but you're in trouble, you know, if you get anywhere near this one. I don't love these others, you know, if they come anywhere near harming this one. The, that type of, of um, obviously we're going to protect this one, but that can go too far. We're, we're always like fighting the infinite enemies to protect this one. Ultimately, like when we're had this, we had this beautiful interview with one of our great spiritual teachers when my wife was pregnant. 
she asked, you know, what's going to be my spiritual path now? I have a lot of responsibilities coming. I don't have a lot of extra time. And he said simply, you know, just to love all other beings the way you're going to love that one, the way you're loving that little one coming. Can you love all beings like that? And indeed, in the six and one, when you work it through and you negotiate those imprints from the ownership fields, you can arrive at that unconditional love. First with yourself, then with your beloved, then with all beings. That work works. That work works. You do the work and you get the benefit. And that it's something you take with you wherever you go. And in fact, it's the only work that ultimately you take with you. You know, when we finish this life, we don't take anything materially of it with us. We just take our karma with us. And karma is a product of how it is we are with others. So the more loving that we are, peace and harmony that we make in our world, then that's what we're creating as the uh, field for our future, stuff, the stuff that our future is made out of. And he was all like mush doggies, you know, to press on and engage in the practice and practice it. We don't get it perfect, we don't get it right the first time, that's why we call it a practice. And to enjoy the process, that, that where you are in it right now, is the perfect place for you to be. You know, that, that we we see where we want to get with it, but that shouldn't, you know, deter us from enjoying and relaxing into where we are right now with the work. With whatever it is at hand, you know, whatever it is that's arising. That's who we want to work with first relevant, what's that got its relevancy and traction, then mush. And he would say, keep on keeping on. Because <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what's going to come up in your relationship. These things are going to be there. We either get on with it or we postpone it. Distract ourselves from it, you know. <laughs> There's whole industries set up to do that. But after a while, it becomes stale, the distracting folly, the youthful folly. And we just get to the work, and there's joy in it. There's actually something that changes and grows and emerges more and more beautifully. We dedicate the merit, if there's positivity in this, to the benefit of all beings. All their suffering, all their hardships created by snags in the six and one, in those formative relationships, dissolving, greater, greater love and intimacy emerging, and then all beings coming to enjoy the perfectly pure inner expression of who they really are. <laughs> Jaya Jaya Siddhi Siddhi Pala Pala 
Mama, Colin, Sammy.